Hi everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology and this is a Nightlight video blog. And today we're going to be looking at the topic, has uh, modern psychology ruined astrology? Uh, it's kind of might sound like, oh my God, what an inflammatory topic. But the title of today's talk actually comes directly from a popular article on uh, quartz that was recently published called Astrology Isn't Fake, It's Just Been Ruined by Modern Psychology. So the, uh, the topic of today's video blog is a kind of follow-up discussion about this kind of controversial inflammatory article that was written um, by that title. So uh, it, it was a powerful article and one that I really enjoyed but uh, I didn't always enjoy, I, I didn't exactly enjoy it for the reasons that some people might think. Um, that and the title of the, of the article um, isn't exactly, a, it's an inflammatory title, right? It's, it's a title that's meant to shock and provoke. But the actual content of the article I don't think is as inflammatory as the title. So if you haven't read this yet, I'm going to put the link into the chat box so that you can check it out later if you'd like. But um, I wanted to address this because it's a really fascinating topic and a fascinating article. Uh, so I made a, I took points from the article and have some things to say. First of all, I'd recommend that you read it if you haven't. But even if you haven't read it, today's blogcast will make probably perfect sense to most people. So um, good to see some familiar faces, by the way. Um, so again, the title of the article was Astrology Isn't Fake, It's Just Been Ruined by Modern Psychology. And this is on Quartz, um, which uh, is a more mainstream source um, for, um, uh, you know, it's a more mainstream readership. It's not like an astrology website. Now, the, a good question to start off with when, you know, sort of examining the historical difference between psychology and astrology is to ask a simple question. What's the difference between astrology and psychology? Is there a substantive difference between astrology and psychology? Now, the topic is really vast, right? So this is not something that Adam Ellenboss sits down and answers all of your questions in a little video blog. Um, it's a vast topic, and so today's talk isn't meant to be some kind of final word or authoritative explanation about the difference between psychology and astrology. It's a, it's a fascinating conversation to be had, and hopefully today's talk is just adding to that conversation and offering you my own reflections on the question about the difference between psychology and astrology over, you know, seven years of professional practice. Um, I would also defer to many of my colleagues who also have, you know, probably really incredible opinions that may add to or go in a slightly different direction than my own. Um, so again, this is just meant for, you know, people to uh, engage in the conversation that's out there right now that a lot of people are actually thinking about. So um, I think the article is good, but I want to start by just saying the word ruined is really far too strong. When the article uh, is saying, has modern psychology ruined astrology? No, it's not. Of course it hasn't. That's just silly. Um, uh, and the article's also, there's some inaccuracies in the article about ancient and modern astrology. I would say some, some forms of generalizing that aren't necessarily great either. But um, what I appreciate most is that this is a mainstream article and it's written in an attempt to try to distinguish between modern psychological practices that incorporate astrology and traditional predictive astrology, which um, I do believe uh, is are, are very different. I see this as a valuable difference to explore. And in fact, that's at the core of what my work is about. In the past few years, I've led... Um, a course uh, called Ancient Astrology for Modern Times. And one of the core parts of that, uh, the courses that I teach being called Ancient Astrology for Modern Times is to dig into the differences between ancient and modern forms of astrology, not necessarily saying one is better than the other or this one is the superior form or anything like that, but just um, to call out some of the differences and potentially some of the dogmas that surround um, in particular modern astrology. I do believe that modern astrology has its own dogmas, and I think a lot of them are entrenched in a psychological use of astrology. That doesn't mean that they're bad. That doesn't mean that they're not effective or beautiful in their own right. But 
a lot of people, I think, mistakenly think that the that psychological forms of astrology are how astrology has always been practiced. So that's kind of what I'm trying to work toward. Uh, you know, making finer distinctions is a big part of my work um, between um, modern and ancient uh, practices. Now, uh, let's but let's like ask ourselves, what does the word psychology mean? Um, well, to the ancient Greeks, um, psyche was a word for soul. Uh, today, some people, when they think of psychology, they think of the study of the soul. Um, other times, people conflate the word psyche with mind. And so some people think of psychology as the study of the mind, the study of behavior, the study of your brain, stuff like that, right? But other people think of, again, other people will think of... Um, uh, psychology um, a little bit more esoterically as a study of the soul. So first of all, we just have to start off with the idea that there is no one psychology, just like there's really not just one astrology. There are many psychologies. There are many ideas about what psychology is. There are many um, astrologies and forms of astrology over time. And we should just honor that diversity and start with respect for that diversity. Um, first of all, especially if we trust in the providence of the universe or the providence of God. So that, and that's, that's my own opinion speaking. Now, um, the, uh, insofar though, as modern psychology is broadly understood, not by all of us, and I'm preaching to the choir for those people who think, you know, psychology is a study of the soul. Probably you and I, and a lot of people who are into astrology would understand a lot of psychology to be very interested in the reality of the human soul. But, Astrology has a, an, a, a place in modern consciousness that is really deeply embedded with psychological, um, with psychological understandings of the, the brain and behavior that are not necessarily spiritual, that don't necessarily take into consideration the soul. And that's, that, that's a real thing to be aware of. So, in the world, many people think that psychology is primarily about a study of the mind, behavior, mental or emotional illnesses, um, uh, thought or behavioral patterning, and diagnosing and healing or, or fixing behavioral or psychological issues. Now, um, it's it's safe to say that those that, that that sort of popular version of like personality, personality profiling, character, behavior. Uh, sort of mental, emotional psychology, that the whole world has more or less adopted the stance that, you know, looking into your own character, behavior, etc., is a, a worthwhile endeavor. And it, it is not at all guaranteed that people who believe that that's a worthwhile endeavor have any kind of theological conclusions about God or the nature of spirit or the human soul or, or anything like that. So, the first thing that I liked about this article was that insofar as a lot of the world doesn't think of psychology in terms of something spiritual, astrology can very easily, when it's co-opted by psychology, turn into nothing more than a, a, um, a sort of artistic language for describing behavior. And it, it gets, it kind of gets camped into this like sort of clinical, mental, you know, brain, brain and behavior studies. And I'm definitely like, I'm not for that. But I don't imagine that a lot of modern psychological astrologers are for that either, right? Like, none of my Jungian friends, none of my, you know, none of my friends practicing depth psychology would really like that idea of what psych, that that's not psychology to most people who I think really love psychological forms of astrology, right? We believe in the human soul, we're mystics and, and so forth. So, but there, it's an important distinction to make because a lot of people who pick up Vogue magazine or, you know, a, a, a newspaper uh, sun sign column or they know a bit about their, their sun sign or whatever, they're basically understanding astrology within the context of behavioral psych and there's, there's, there's not necessarily a clean and clear connection to ancient metaphysics or ancient mysticism or even modern mysticism. So, um, <clears throat> uh, astrology, 
has been about the study of um, traditionally has been about the study of the mind, behavior, um, the body, temperament, um, medical health. So astrology has a, a very long history of being used diagnostically in order to understand things like temperament and behavior and physical mental health. That's not anything new to astrology. Um, so in, in so far as um, in so far as astrology, uh, you know, has always been interested in those things, astrology has always included uh, the interests of psychology, you could say. However, what I really want to be clear about, and this is my own opinion speaking, is that astrology cannot be equated with psychology, because while psychology can be an aspect or element of what astrology can do or maybe should do, it is not all that it does. It is not all that it should do. And it's metaphysics in, in many ways. The ancient astrologers had elaborately worked out metaphysics that are in some, some ways very starkly contrasted to some of the um, values and, and philosophies and, and thinking of modern psychology. So um, anyway, so insofar as, um, let's see, where, where's my notes? Now, insofar as modern psychology, again, is about the study of the soul, I really do believe that it fits into a nice long line of mystical traditions whose goal is the exploration of reality, metaphysics, uh, the nature of the soul, the nature of God or the gods, the nature of the human soul's relationship to divinity, and so forth. And cer certain forms of modern psychology certainly fall in that mystic line. And I, I, I want to defend, sort of, sort of adamantly defend, that modern astrology used in service of a kind of esoteric alchemical psychology like the kind that Carl Jung brought forth and others is really valuable. There's nothing wrong with that. However, there are still major differences even between things like modern Jungian psychology and um, ancient metaphysics and, and ancient um, astrological philosophy. They're, they're really big differences in some cases that really, I think, have to be looked at. Whether you would go one direction or not, it, I think my what I'm passionate about is just trying to, uh, again, sort of educate people about some of the differences. Um, but we have to um, also ask the question, what is the purpose of modern psychology? Let's go back to that for a second. What are the goals or ambitions or claims of modern psychology, and why might they be problematic for astrology? Um, again, they're not singular. There's many different psychological uh, streams of thought and goals. There are many psychologies out there, um, and there's many different ideas about why we do psychology or what its goals are. So for the sake of making it a little simpler, I just made a little bullet point list of what I think most people, like general population consensus reality agreement as to what psychology is and does. Psychology, the goal of understanding behavior, personality, and character the goal of possibly improving personality, behavior, character, perhaps by looking at how behavior, character, and personality uh, is formed through different kinds of traumatic events or uh, different kinds of conditioning and things like that. The belief that also accompanying this is a general belief, it's pr prevalent everywhere, just go into the self-help section of any Barnes & Noble, right? The general belief accompanying most people's understanding of psychology is that with some kind of therapeutic work or an understanding of behavior, um, personality, and, and character that um, you will come to have pot potentially more control over the circumstances of your life or perhaps more personal happiness. So um, that's, a, that's a general sort of, I would say, some of the just modern basic beliefs or assumptions about what psychology is and what it does. Now, along with this comes a sort of vague idea that probably most people also have um, about something called the unconscious, right? Now, I'm not talking about Jung's unconscious. I'm not talking about the elaborately worked out philosophies surrounding the unconscious. Certainly, there are people who have spent their whole lives writing dissertations and teaching people about the history of the word and its use and what is the unconscious, mapping its reality as a concept and an idea, and etc. I want to just be really simple here. Most people cannot say what the unconscious is. 
they use the word unconscious as a kind of catch-all for the things about ourselves that we don't understand or things about ourselves that may dictate our lives precisely because we don't understand them or we're not aware of them. I would say that's a very just basic general understanding that people have of the word unconscious. And in this respect, the astrological birth chart, when we use modern, these modern psychological understandings and goals, along with our understanding of the unconscious and the general idea that if you can get to know stuff about yourself that you're not aware of, you'll get to know the things that are otherwise dictating your life, and you'll get some control back and maybe some more happiness. Now, first of all, I just want to honor this because there's something about this that's clearly true, right? Like, I don't think most people would disagree with this. Like, if I've done anything of, you know, uh, personal psychological growth work in my life, all of what I just said has been, you know, to a certain extent true. Like, I've looked at my behaviors and patterns and done what I can to become more aware of them so that they don't dictate my life, so that I can have a little bit more say in how I behave or act or something like that. So first of all, let's just validate that. Um, <clears throat> It also is not safe to say that what I just described is anywhere near the equivalent of the sophistication of the ideas of Carl Jung or, you know, I'm not trying to summarize the, you know, schools of depth psychology or, or anything like that. I'm just trying to give some general definitions of um, modern psychology, its goals, aims, and specifically the idea of the unconscious that most people sort of walk around with. Now, um, uh, you know, Carl Jung's ideas were quite sophisticated. They, you know, uh, if you've ever read Jung or you know his work, um, you know, there's uh, a kind of esoteric and alchemical process in the psychological work that, in fact, does have in mind a somewhat similar goal that ancient mystics had, which is the discovery of the self or of, in some ways, the consciousness behind all of the masks that we live and operate with or that live in the unconscious or something like that. So these are noble spiritual and mystical goals that um, are not... Um, they're not necessarily representative, though, of what most people understand to be psychology. So um, here's, the, here's the, where the problem comes in. Um, the problem comes in when we mistakenly think that this is always how astrology has been practiced or why it's been practiced. That astrology, that the birth chart itself is a map of the unconscious or that it's a map of the psyche and that it's a map of behavior, and all behavior is only fate insofar as you're unaware of it. But once you're aware of it, then it just becomes a set of possibilities. And with awareness of those possibilities comes the ability to use them like you're flying your own X-wing, right? You, you suddenly take control of the ship because you now know you know your, your, your map of your psyche, and then the, everything in the chart just becomes possibilities. That's a very like new, super, super modern idea in a lot of ways. Um, and that, I, I really want to just make the point that that is not how astrology has always been practiced. I, I want to make some quotes here from, from Jung to just pick on him a little bit, even though I, I see a Jungian therapist weekly and wouldn't trade those sessions for the world. Like I really do value, you know, psychology. Um, but Jung once rather arrogantly said, in my opinion, that astrology represents all the psychological knowledge of antiquity. To me, this is a sort of, this, this is a potential area of, of like modern arrogance that exists, where there's this kind of condescending statement that supposes the worldview or understanding of ancient, astrolog ancient astrologers wasn't as sophisticated as Jung or Jung's sort of more clinical, psychological medicinal understanding of the soul or the mind. Um, this particular kind of statement that basically all um, astrology is, is the psychological knowledge of really old people, right? Um, this kind of statement, though, is really, I think it's a modern dogma in astrology. I, I really, I really feel that way. It's just being in the field and observing what pe a lot of people have said over time, and what a lot of clients come to me with the assumption of. 
um, it, it sort of assumes that ancient people didn't really know what we know now about the mind or about the soul or about the psyche or about mental health or something like that. It also um, assumes that ancient astrologers were sort of doing a primitive form of psychology. And now that we know what psychology really is and we're really advancing in this sort of more scientific, uh, progressive understanding of the, the human mind and psyche, then astrology is really better served in, per, in the pursuit of those things because long ago, you know, it was this more primitive superstitious thing and, um, and, and, you know, it'd really be better if people were using it for these new advanced understandings. I, I believe, and people may not agree with me, and that's fine. I would, I would never lose a friendship over any of this, right? But people, people will um, totally full on um, believe that this is true and that ancient astrology is just some kind of primitive superstitious thing. I think that's really unfortunate because... Um, I don't think it's a patient enough philosophical comparison or analysis. So that, that's, that's where I start. Okay, so for starters, ancient astrologers believed in fate. Now, they believed, we'll just give you a little rundown of this. So ancient astrologers believed that the sub, called, sometimes called the sublunary world, in their sort of metaphysical imagining of the cosmos, they believed that the, the, the heavenly spheres sort of, the earth was sort of in the center of their model. And then you have the sphere of the moon right above the earth and then Mercury and so forth going all the way up to Saturn and the fixed stars and so forth. Everything below the moon was thought to be sort of contained within the realm of fate. Everything below the moon in the sublunary world um, especially, you know, you're going into things like uh, Plato and, and Platonic thinking, and but it's common in Indian metaphysics as well, in Indian philosophy as well, um, that the, the world that human beings inhabit, like Earth basically, uh, is largely governed by mechanistic laws and rules of cause and effect. And um, ancient astrologers really believed that sort of the, the, the a general sort of mystical concept that covers the the cause and effect workings of this world that we live in was called fate. That's how I've come to understand it. But fate is also a, it, it's a spiritual and mystical concept as well. But basically you can simplify the understanding of fate to be the world we live in is a world of cause and effect. And it's a cyclical world too. It's a world that's composed of opposites and cyclical dynamics between opposites. And in that world of cyclical dynamics between opposites, everything is more or less working according to basically like physics. It's like cause and effect. So um, one of the things that the article points out is that these ancient astrologers were like scientists. And I think that one way of understanding it is that, yeah, they were, but they, they were scientists in the sense that they were trying to understand the operating rules of what you or I might call karma. In, I, I feel like the word karma, not many people have a problem with, but the word fate, we get really offended by. And one of the reasons we get offended by fate is because it, it feeds right into our, our really strong and intense defense of free will. But don't even think about, in my opinion, you shouldn't even think about fate in a binary with free will. It's, a, it's an inappropriate comparison. Fate is much more, to me, like the, just like the concept of karma. It, the sublunary world of ancient astrologers that we live in is a world of cause and effect. And their work was to try to understand its laws that govern human life, that govern all sorts of aspects of human life. Now, um, this isn't just dry materialist science, though, of course. This is also very, you know, um, there's a, definitely a mystical component to it. Um, <clears throat> The human body that the soul is born into for there's first of all there is a distinction between the soul and the body or the spirit and the body whichever way you want to look at it and when a, a body when a human is born into a body then they're born into a body that is bound to some extent by rules of cause and effect which means your life that as a soul that you're living maybe perhaps in this incarnation and there's been many incarnations but the the life that you're born into because it's in the material world is governed by laws. And I, be, I believe that, that that understanding can really help us liberate um, the superstition that we actually have as modern people around the ancient concept of fate. Um, 
in some ways, ancient astrologers are a bit like modern scientists. They're they're looking at uh, they're trying to look very objectively at the operating rules of that that dictate and govern a person's life. Now, the birth chart was used primarily as a tool in order to understand the fated events of a human life. Uh, however, this was done for a pretty esoteric purpose by a lot of different astrologers of different backgrounds. There's different philosophical schools. There's not just one, but one of the singular purposes of ancient astrologers was um, to draw a distinction between the body and the material karma of the body and the soul that inhabits the body. Really chief goal. The birth chart is used in some ways then to... Um, the study of fate is then used to develop a deeper awareness of the soul who's going to experience a certain fate or destiny. If you can understand that you have a fate to live in a, as a soul in a human form, um, then you're in an immediate position to cling to the soul rather than clinging to the body. What happens when you cling to the body? Well, according to, again, this is Buddhists, this is the yogis, these are Christians, the, you know, most world religions and mystical traditions, even, uh, you know, even folk shamanic traditions have some version of this. Be careful not to get addicted to your Coca-Cola, right? <laughs> right? Like super, super simple stuff. Like, be careful not to get addicted to the stuff in this world. Don't get addicted to praise. Don't get addicted to accomplishment. Don't get addicted to sex. Don't get addicted to, you know, romance. Don't get addicted to uh, poverty. Don't get addicted to wealth. Don't get addicted to anything in this world because all of it is tempting you to potentially get addicted to it because its nature is to run you in cycles. And when you're in one place, you want the opposite. And then you go until you get the opposite and then you don't want it and you want the opposite. Or you're propelled from one to the other in a sort of miserable way. Now that's not to say that the material world isn't also beautiful in its own respect, but it's a place where it, it, almost all these different mystical traditions tell us you have to be very careful. This is samsara, this is maya, this is the sublunary world, and it's very easy to mistake your identity, who you are and what you're worth as, as a being with all of these fluctuations, with all of these ups and downs and, and loop-de-loops, right? So um, if you look at the birth chart as a study of fate, for these ancient mystics, this is actually an empowering thing. It's not a disempowering thing to look at a birth chart and understand that you're looking at a picture of your material karma or your material fate. Um, because if you can learn to accept your fate, that's the key to spiritual freedom. That's the key to being more identified with yourself as an eternal spirit soul than with the dynamics of the material world. Now, I don't think that a lot, I actually don't think most people have a problem with this. I think we actually live, I think this, because I think this is actually fundamentally true, that's my belief speaking, I don't believe, I look at the world and I don't think most people have an inherent problem with this understanding of things. I think we all live with it all the time. We speak in its cliches all the time. Don't get attached to this, let go, etc. It's all common knowledge. I see it in my Facebook stream every day. Uh, so you can get gain a kind of healthy distance. This distance in time as it grows, uh, it, it, I said healthy distance. We're not talking about hating the world, hating your body, hating the material space. There are traditions that certainly would emphasize the material world is just a purely evil place and anything and everything here is just an, you know, an entirely a prison sentence. And I'm not speaking of some kind of punitive view of material reality in contrast to your soul. I'm talking about healthy distance, healthy distance from the fate that you're here to live. A kind of detached but mindful observance and participation. And that is something that we can cultivate through the birth chart when the birth chart is being used to describe our, our fate or our circumstances, our karma. Uh, the prediction and description of fate facilitates um, this spiritual awareness. But to many ancient people, self-improvement, when, when they were talking about self-improvement, um, my sense is, having read a lot of ancient philosophy, uh, is that self-improvement begins and ends with the willingness to accept what fate has decreed. Self-improvement has to do with using your will to be deeply 
um, accepting, d- deeply, you participate um, in all of the elements of your destiny or your or your fate uh, with a kind of um, with a kind of willingness. Uh, and and when that willingness is there, um, there's an incredible sense of freedom and happiness that's cultivated. But it's transcendental freedom. It's not freedom, you know, related to getting the piece of pie that I really want or getting the money that I really want or getting the job or making sure that my vision board turns out exactly as I want it to. You guys know I, I like to rip on vision boards. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, now just to say that, I'm going to do a vision board at some point and put it up in another video. All right. Uh, now, the, the, here's a radical thing to think about that ancient astrologers likely would have said that who you are truly as a soul, which may be the goal of doing astrology to understand, to grow closer to that thing that you are, is beyond description, is beyond what the chart shows. It's beyond a map. It's beyond a blueprint. It's beyond your material karma. It's beyond a birth chart. It's beyond what the planets are saying in this, this, this wheel that you're looking at. So the point of getting to know your chart is in some ways specifically to not be identifying who you are with it. And I can tell you firsthand as an astrologer practicing for a long time now that as you practice more and more, and a lot, I think a lot of astrologers that I've spoken to share this belief, you're actually, you become less interested in birth charts. You become less interested in um, when you first meet someone, you're not saying, hey, let me see your chart. You're not, you know, when my daughter was born, I didn't do her chart right away. I waited a long time. When, when I barely look at my chart anymore, I just don't. I, 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 I know that I would be out of business as an astrologer if people weren't looking at their charts. So it's not that I don't think it's worthwhile. But it is that I think that over time, the sort of spiritual goal of astrology is to not be so attached to your birth chart. Now, one of the problems with the modern psychological, and I'm talking now about sort of pop psychology, not the, you know in-depth alchemical Jungian stuff, but just the way that the way that astrology can be co-opted by just sort of bland modern pop psychology is to the detriment of becoming detached from what astrology has to say about your character. It's like, you know, Heraclitus is a famous Greek philosopher who surely had an influence on many of the founding um, astrologers. He said, the soul is explored forever to a depth beyond report. And I'd like to think that what astrology does at its finest over time is to convince you that that's exactly what's true about you. I'm not a Leo, I'm not a Virgo, I'm not a Cancer, I'm not a, I'm not a T-square, I'm not a Grand Cross, I'm not a fiery person. At a certain point, you get exhausted with all of that, even though on some level that's operating and that may be true. On another level, reinforcing your identification with any of that does nothing for you. Now, that's a pretty bold claim. You, again, you don't have to agree with me, but that's, you know, something to think about. Now, some people will sort of object to the ancient view of fate, right? They'll say, ooh, I like the birth chart better as a set of, like, possibilities, right? And if you get to know them, you become really conscious, then you're sort of driving the X-wing, and I really like that. And that's fine. Again, there's many astrologies. There's not, like, you know, it's not trying to create a philosophical dictatorship here. But... um Let's say, let's just take a moment to recognize that ancient astrologers did have some very sophisticated ideas about free will. They weren't just fatalists. So there's a big difference between believing in the reality of fate and being a fatalist. Um, some ancient astrologers, for example, believed that the realm of fate, which is again tantamount to the sort of cause and effect of the material world, and the material body that they believe the soul or spirit is born into, um, that this uh, this realm of fate was encompassed by a larger realm of providence, of angelic intelligences, of of um, of higher higher universal, you know, gods or demigods, and of or maybe even the Godhead, the universal God. And so, though, first of all, though our lives may be to a great extent uh, operating in a realm that is predictable according to laws that are predictable, which is what makes our lives in a birth chart predictable. They are also held within a larger sphere of uh, God's will. I mean, putting it really simply, this isn't far from what we use every day, whether you like the word God or not. No, most people don't have a problem with saying, well, whatever the universe 
says, whatever the universe does, however the universe intervenes. People use the phrase the universe. But what we're really saying is some kind of higher intelligence could intervene in my life in a way that may interact with the, the laws of cause and effect or the laws of karma um, to change the script. Well, ancient people believed that too. That's not a new idea. It's not, uh, ancient astrologers are not so primitive to not have a, an idea of, of providence. Um, also, we shouldn't imagine that ancient astrologers uh, didn't believe that your will was not important or that you didn't have free will or choice. Um, let's just pause there for um, uh, a moment. Uh, here's the big thing to the big distinction to make is that a lot of us in, in you know, modern times, we think of our will as the measure of reality. So we're, we're, we place a lot of emphasis on my choice, my will, my freedom. That's what creates things. We rarely recognize the context of race, of socioeconomic status, of heredity, of genetics, of a huge amount of things that are already putting parameters over what we can and can't do or will or won't do with whatever amount of choice or freedom that we have. Um, so for, that's, that's first. We tend to skip over all of that stuff, and it's, not, it's sometimes taboo to even talk about the fact that all of that is a, is a definite reality. In fact, we, in some ways, we give scientists too much shit about that stuff when it's really, it, it, it's really actually real. Um, but at any rate, that's an aside. Ancient astrologers did believe that you have choice, that you have will, but they also were much more keen on recognizing that that will is taking place within the material world. Will is something that exists in the material realm for them as far as I've understood in my studies. Will is something that is intimately and immediately bound up in cause and effect. There's no way you can use your will in the material world that isn't bound into time and space, in which case it's bound into a realm of materiality and, and karmic or material laws. So it's not that they didn't believe in choice as much as it is that they believed that, A, there's a lot of parameters around choice, and um, temperament is a big part of the study of that. If you understand temperament and, and you understand character, then to some extent you understand some of the parameters that you're working with. You understand what you're likely to or not likely to do with your free will. Uh, so that's, that's something else to think about. Uh, the other thing is that um, if you use your free will and you think that your free will is what's going to make you free, just think about that for a second, right? Like your free will is really free up until the moment you use it, at which point then, then it's not free because it's bound to whatever you choose and it's bound to the consequences of the choices and so on and so forth. So first of all, just recognizing that the whole concept of will is something taking place in, in time and space and it's something that can't help but, you know, sort of operate within, um, within that paradigm. So Understanding that is essential to understanding how ancient astrologers thought about choice. But then you also have to understand that there's, um, there's also this idea of karma. And this is more coming from the East. But the other idea is that, um, you know, in the East, it's, it's also very legitimate to say, look, you have free will but you also have karma that's going to blossom in this life, right? And the, the karma is blossoming because of how you've used your free will in past lives. So, what, in a sense, what is fated was chosen. And that's, that's a paradox, right? But what is fated is chosen. We do have free will. And sometimes when you have free will, but you're also dealing with some portion or some amount of your life being um, fated by karma, by previous choices, then the best use of the free will, again, comes to be in the acceptance or the response to your karma. So you can generate good karma for future lifetimes, or you can generate good karma for the future. It's true, but a lot of that good karma is not so much just about, you know, what am, what am I doing? How many therapy sessions am I going to in order to get a better behavioral complex and then will my way to a better future, as much as it is about how we respond to the karma that we're born into and how that response can serve in the generation of newer and better karma that takes time to establish. You may not see it in this lifetime, right? But that doesn't mean it doesn't count for future lifetimes. Now, all of that is also 
uh, again, that's just a part of like the Eastern paradigm of karma that's present within the history of astrology. Um, here's another quote that's very famous among um, modern sort of modern uh, psychological astrologers. This comes from Jung again. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Now, again, there's, there's another quote, right, about um, basically suggesting that um, only the untrained mind or sort of the unexamined psyche believes in, in fate, or only the untrained or unexamined mind or psyche experiences fate. Um, I, I personally believe that that's taking too many, that's taking a, 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 a too great a liberty. And so I, I'm more inclined to say, well, I think that's partially true, that being conscious certainly helps with um, changing the nature of karma or, or destiny or fate. That I do believe that it helps. At the same time, um, I think that we, we need to... Um, we need to just be very careful that we don't think that the measure of our freedom from fate is our will because it's our it's really i think it's really better understood as our our will is intimately related to why we have a certain fate and it's hard to see that when we don't sort of zoom out and understand that the soul has a has a vast history anyway that's just another aside um uh so Let's see here, going through my notes. Uh, da, 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 da. Now, enlightening ourselves, there's another thing. The use of your free will to enlighten yourself, right? That's fair, right? Like, who wants to say, like, oh, everything's faded. Well, where's, what do I, how is enlightenment achieved then, right? Like, the, the will participates in enlightenment. Um, it does. There's a great quote from uh, Sri Ramakrishna that I want to read. Um, let me just pull it up here. <clears throat> Sri Ramakrishna said, Go beyond knowledge and ignorance. Only then can you realize God. To know many things is ignorance. Pride of scholarship is also ignorance. The unwavering conviction that God alone dwells in all beings is jnana, knowledge. To know him intimately is vid vidyana, a richer knowledge. If a thorn gets into your foot, a second thorn is needed to take it out. When it is out, both thorns are thrown away. You have to procure the thorn of knowledge to remove the thorn of ignorance. Then you must set aside both knowledge and ignorance. God is beyond both knowledge and ignorance. Now, why am I sharing that? Because that's a paradox, right? But that's sort of, I believe that that's very close to what ancient mystics believed was the appropriate use of the will. The will is a thorn, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's something that's going to prick you if you get too obsessed with it, but it can be used to dig out the other thorn of ignorance. But then once you dig it out, you also have to begin discarding the emphasis that you place on will. So that's, that's I, I believe, a, a pretty significant difference in some ways than the emphasis we place on will and its relationship to happiness in a sort of generic modern psychology paradigm. If modern astrology is only ever telling people also what they want to hear, Right. This is a big problem. Is that if you go to um, uh, if you go to um, an astrologer and they're doing psychological astrology, um, then basically what you're there to hear about is yourself, right? And nobody wants to be nobody wants to be told that we're bad people, right? Nobody wants to hear that there's something that's challenging or difficult um, or f even faded about who they are like as a being, which is totally understandable. Why should we, we should all never want astrology to tell you that who you are or what you are is bad. Because who you are or what you are, even to ancient astrologers, is an eternal spirit soul, for, for at least for many of them. So, but here's, here's the problem. If modern, if modern astrology, psychological astrology, thinks that the birth chart is who you are, then of course, of course, you're never going to want the birth chart to say anything bad about who a person is because you, you're you conflating the birth chart with the soul. And that's a big problem. And again, I, ancient astrologers did not do that. So um, that's, that's very important. Um, 
Now, another thing, uh, going back to Will for a second, this is just a bullet point that I missed, is that in, enlightenment is also not something that's easy, right? So the use of the will to procure ignorance, to, to be enlightened, and then to discard the will, that's not easy. That's not something you do by, you know, slapping, um, slapping some inspiring quotes on our wall and taking a sexy picture of ourselves doing a yoga pose on Instagram, right? That's not, like, in, you know... Spiritual work is spiritual work. There's we. I'm going to be super Capricorn about it, right? Like, there's no, there's no just to, just to uh, betray my own Capricorn moon there. Like, there's no, there's, there's no shortcuts in this enlightenment process. To to use the will to pluck the thorn out of your own foot, the thorn of ignorance, is painful and it takes work, it takes discipline, it takes commitment over a long period of time. It's not an easy process, but the results are transcendental. The results turn difficult things into beautiful things. That's the reward of the work. Now, again, you, uh, you know, some people might put it more gracefully than, than I, right? So more, maybe more generously than, than I, but at any rate, um, so if modern psych astrology is only about character analysis, then nobody's ever going to want to hear what's a, a chart saying anything wrong about them because what they're really looking for is to go beyond themselves as a material being. So, um, yeah, I think that, I think that, that does provide real challenges for, um, you know, astrology practiced only in the service of, of psychology. Now, um, uh, most, again, most mystical traditions don't ultimately describe happiness as something within time and space. If there is happiness to be found here for many mystics, it has to do with learning to see transcendental beauty, which is found in suffering, in a willingness to suffer. I really liked one part of this article in particular at the very sort of um, beginning uh, it says, today, modern psychology has cast astrology as a fantastical way that people of the past project the workings of their minds onto the environment around them. This interpretation leaves far too much wiggle room for astrology to simply sound like affirmations of what people want to hear about themselves and think about the world. Even worse, the nurturing approach psychologists take, which isn't a bad thing, has polluted modern astrology with watered-down interpretations that seek to protect their clients. Understandably, right? If, that, if we're doing psychology, it's a different thing. Even if astrological configuration spells trouble, the modern astrologer will describe it as an, quote, opportunity for growth, as if they were a patronizing middle manager. Where is the trust in that? Now, I know that might sound a little cynical, and for some people that's just like, oh, I just don't like that tone. Um, if you've had positive, uplifting, supportive experiences with psychological astrology in the, in the modern day, then, then you know, you know that it's not like that. It's not, it's not just watered down hooey. Like that, that's really unfair. But I can tell you as someone who came into it having experienced a lot of that kind of woo, that kind of woo woo was a big part of my initial like sort of indoctrination into astrology. Then I do think that we have a little bit of a problem because uh, opportunities for growth, if all that means is opportunities for getting stuff that you prefer, that's not teaching people to uh, get in touch with the spirit soul whose transcendental happiness is found in the, in the crucible of suffering. A lot of it. That's why the first noble truth of Buddhism is suffering. That's why the first, basically the noble truth of all moksha traditions, liberation traditions is suffering because in suffering, you discover that suffering doesn't have to be suffering. Okay. Anyway, all of what I'm saying today uh, is again, not to dismiss Jung, it's not to dismiss psychology, it's not to dismiss psychological astrology, but I wanted to explain a little bit deeper why I felt like the article that came out was so important and just my own take or what I would sort of add to it. Um, astrology is, I think what we need to understand is that astrology has always had a psychological feature. Astrology has always included the scope and interests and goals of psychology, of understanding mind, behavior, of potentially improving behavior, of becoming more conscious of unconscious behavioral patterns. All of that has always been a part of astrology. But that is not all that astrology is. And unless we draw some really fine distinctions, I'm afraid that um, people will have all the ammunition they need to not take astrology seriously. Some element of predictive astrology is good. I'm not talking about the predictive astrology that, you know, just tries to pride itself on get you know i got the right answer 
right? But if I can sit down with a client like I have in the past couple of years since learning um, Hellenistic, ancient medieval astrology, and I can say this time window, really good chance you're getting pregnant and I'm getting confirmations on that often. Or if I can say, uh, you know, around this time job promotion, or if I can, you know, if I can actually do work in predicting the uh, causal dynamics of karma, that's how I would, that's what I would say. And I can also do deeper psychological work with somebody. I think that 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 gives people an understanding of astrology that's actually much, much richer. I know that if astrology was just some kind of fatalistic science, that it could be really depressing, especially when so, so many, so much of what we need in the modern world is an inner life. We need psychological depth. We need interiority. Like those things are so important. So I'm I'm not suggesting that you know modern astrology should just chuck back to some ancient era and just do straight up predictive work and be real hardcore about karma and and all of that, right? But I'm I'm passionate personally about trying to educate people about what I feel are some of the major theoretical differences and philosophical values between modern psychology in the sort of general popular sense and how it's co-opted astrology and traditional astrology because Traditional astrology encompasses psychology, not the other way around. And it, it, I think that the biggest modern dogma goes back to that quote from Jung. All uh, uh, astrology represents all the ancient uh, psychological knowledge of antiquity, as though all that ancient astrology is and was was just a sort of more primitive form of psychology. I, I think it's really dangerous dogma personally, especially after having studied a lot of traditional theory and philosophy. Um, the last thing that I'll say before we close <clears throat> is that the other major difference is that the, the techniques and theories and methods of ancient astrology are a little bit more law-oriented. They're a little bit more about like laws of karma. They're more methodical. They're, they're a little, um, they have, um, an operating intelligence that's a little tighter and more Saturnine, truly. I mean, to use to use a sort of, you know, uh, to to psych, sort of psychologize the 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 mood of ancient astrology, it is a little bit more Saturnine. However, uh, don't forget that Saturn is exalted in the sign of Venus, right? Saturn is exalted in Libra. I was born with an exalted Saturn. I have deep experience of uh, valuing and loving elaborate and beautiful architecture. The laws of the cosmos are not just heavy and punitive. I think a lot of us have been damaged by sort of Old Testament Protestant Christianity or like Catholicism or something where we've been wounded by the idea of a punitive God. We've been wounded by the idea of laws of karma just being heavy. But we, we rarely understand that, you know, the Sistine Chapel is Saturnine. The, you know, the, the most elaborate, beautiful laws of karma in, in the universe are Venetian. They're pleasing. They're beautiful. It, it's not for everyone to learn the ins and outs and sort of rigor of traditional theory. But I beg you, if you know nothing about it, don't judge it until you learn it. Don't judge it until you learn traditional astrology because its intricacies and its beauty are profound. And that's what I'm really passionate about is trying to teach people the beauty of the traditional sort of um, mindset in astrology. And I think at that point, you can add it into your practice. You can use it alongside of whatever things about modern astrology that you like. This is exactly why I teach a course called Ancient Astrology for Modern Times. So I thank you all for listening today. This was a longer lecture, but it's been one that I've had a ton of questions about over time. And so I wanted to, you know, uh, post something about it. I hope you all have enjoyed this. I hope it's been stimulating. If you didn't agree with it, no big deal. Like I, I always, again, I would never want to lose a friend over these kinds of disagreements because at the end of the day, Stephen Forrest recently said on a post that I wrote, it was so cool. Whenever Stephen Forrest posts on anything that I do, I'm like, oh my God, it's so cool. Stephen Forrest said that there's, there's a light behind all good astrology. And I agree with him. And that, that at the end of the day, that's what matters to me more than more than anything. So if this conversation has sort of provoked you or, you know, it's not been your your cup of tea, you found differences, whatever, just know that um, I'm coming from a place that I love you as a soul and I love myself as a soul and I love the world as a soul more than I care about being right. I think it's really important to end on that note. So, okay, guys, take care. Have a beautiful Friday. Bye.